the next segment we're going to, that was the 9-11 segment with regards to, you know, the towers and everything that was going on in New York City. And this is a different segment a little bit. It's We call it the, the bridge segment. And it's going to uh, go from uh, the 9-11 to basically the pandemic to a certain extent. So we're going to show the connections here with the speakers we have coming up. Now, our first speaker is... Uh, Dr. Cynthia McKinney, and she's going to talk about my fight inside and outside Congress for 9-11 and pandemic truth. Now, Cynthia was the sixth time uh, Congresswoman from Georgia, and she has one of the most uh, famous, I think, uh, not attacks, I can't say attacks, she was questioning very hardly the uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld in a classic uh, uh, question and probing of him. So, uh, Cynthia, it's, it's a pleasure for the Lawyers Committee to have you here and an honor, and uh, welcome aboard. Well, thank you very much. I'm about to share my screen. What I'm going to talk about, switching the subject a little, a little bit, is about leadership. I just heard Kevin's presentation. And if he's still available, I want him to know I just bought his book. Um, and uh, my presentation will be about leadership. So basically, um, what I want to say is that, in my opinion, I watched in my life how the civil rights movement the protesters moved from protesting public policy to actually making public policy. And I believe the truth movement veterans are the leaders that we need now for today's extraordinary challenges. I think it must be clear to um, elected, to anyone who is a, a, awake and watching that the current elected officials at best give us half truths and half solutions. Next slide. So what I, um, would like to start with is the fact that these four scholars will inform basically the idea that I'm going to put out tonight. These are four of my favorite academicians, starting with John Mearsheimer. Um, he's like the Dean of International Relations students, of, of which I am one. And he believes in power politics. He believes in the primacy of the state. That's the realist school in international relations. So when John Mearsheimer talks, people listen. And uh, he authored a book that caught my attention that started me to thinking about sort of what will come after in the next form of governance that we'll have and uh, why we need another form of governance. Then you have Peter Dale Scott, who gave us the language because before Peter Dale Scott, I don't know what we call those people who constitute the deep state carrying out deep politics and uh, deep events. But Peter Dale Scott popularized the term deep state. And because of him, we can now imagine, have in our minds, since we're talking about imagination and the lack thereof, well, now we can actually imagine who these people are. We can begin to understand that there's this government within a government. There are these people who are able to leverage government in ways that average ordinary folks just can't. We have Lance DeHaven Smith, who then specified the particular crime. So it's not that 
the deep state is carrying out is care is uh, practicing deep politics by way of deep events only, but they're also committing crimes. And what are those crimes? How do we characterize them? It's not just RICO. It's not just fraud. It's even bigger than that. And these are state crimes against democracy itself. That's what Lance DeHaven Smith gave us. Now, where the 911 truth movement comes in, as far as I'm concerned, is with uh, Mary Yule Bean. And in my PhD studies in leadership, I read her writings and then I fell in love with the way she thinks. Her particular area of expertise is called complexity leadership. And basically that gave me the idea that you, the members of the 911 truth movement are actually the leaders that we have been waiting for. So in my presentation, my plea is going to be that you look at yourselves differently, not just as activists, not just as professionals in whatever your profession might happen to be, but also as creators of the new system of governance that will rise from the ashes of the current one. Next slide, please. So here we have- It's this seven o'clock. Sorry. Here we have this book by uh, Mearsheimer, Why Leaders Lie. Now I'm up in Congress and all I see is lying. All, it, it especially, I mean, it was before September 11th and it was after September 11th. And quite frankly, it was on September 11th. So this book was particularly timely for me because I wanted to explore why these leaders lie. And Mearsheimer gives us this, this rubric um, where he puts truth telling on one hand, and that's us, that's those of us in the truth movement, we're the truth tellers. And what do we do? We look for the facts, and then we allow the facts to tell the story that needs to be told. Well, on the other side of truth telling, according to Mearsheimer, is deception. And then the deception can come in many different forms. Concealments, where you're actually hiding some of the facts. Spinning, where you make the facts appear to be favorable to you. And then outright lying, where you ignore the facts or maybe even contradict the facts. And then underlying, Mearsheimer gives us many different types of lies that can be told, strategic lies, um, interstate lies, uh, fear mongering, uh, strategic cover-ups, and um, I can't see on this little thing, nationalist myth-making, and also liberal lies. So, um, the liberal lies is like, you know, I'm going to destroy your your country so I can make the world safe for democracy. <laughs> liberal lies. And then on the other side, of th those are like the strategic lies that Mearsheimer says are okay to tell. It's okay because it's part of statecraft. Remember, he's all into power politics and statecraft. So it's okay to tell those. The, it, it, you suffer perhaps blowback, but it's okay. It's understandable when leaders tell those lies. What he doesn't go into is the whole second uh area of lying, which is the selfish lies. So if you could go to the next screen, please. Well, it's the selfish lies that dominate all of the wars and most of the things that are going on in, in, in our world 
that I know I joined the truth movement for. And uh, I've written three books about Libya in particular. And then, you know, when our president calls certain countries as whole countries, well, I thought that was worth a book because there's a lot of selfish lies that go into the creation of the conditions in these other countries. And then my most recent book, 2020, When China Sneezes, is all about SARS coronavirus too and COVID because I just happened to have been in China when this thing happened. So we've got, um, according to Mearsheimer, we've got selfish lies, which he doesn't talk about. And a part of those selfish lies are what he calls social imperialism. When you're lying because you want to benefit personally, you want to benefit a certain group or interest group, or it's an ideological kind of uh, uh, policy that you're pushing, the other is the cover up lie. And we've experienced all of that. And Mearsheimer fails to discuss it. Next slide, please. Thank goodness then we have Lance DeHaven Smith who gives us the state crimes against democracy. Because now we know exactly what um, what what these people are doing that's so egregious. And DeHaven Smith defines state crimes against democracy as concerted actions or inactions by government insiders, that's Peter Dale Scott's deep state, intended to manipulate government processes and undermine popular sovereignty. Now, that's exactly what's happening now. That's exactly what's been happening for the last 20 years. Well, even before, if you count the JFK assassination, you go, you, if you go back that far. And who's going to, and Kevin just gave us a list of suspects, but who's going to prosecute them? Now they've per, per, permeated the entire apparatus of governance that we have. They're in every branch, every level is criminal syndicate has taken over the democratic processes that we thought were created for us to enjoy. So now who's going to prosecute this crime, these state crimes against democracy? Next slide, please. Well, actually, <laughs> Mary Yulbeen put this idea in my head as I was trying to understand her model of complexity leadership. And in the MBA courses that I have taught since I got my PhD, I have always used the 911 Truth Movement as an example of complexity leadership. So quite frankly, who's going to prosecute the crimes? Well, no one is going to prosecute them. They haven't been prosecuted for 20 years until we, you, the veterans in truth movements, the various truth movements that exist, actually do some of that as well, which is why in the first slide, I said, it's time for you to get state power. Next slide, please. So as I think about the truth movements that I experienced in my own life, AFK assassination, Malcolm X assassination, MLK assassination, Fred Hampton's assassination, and yes, even uh, Mearsheimer, no, 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 it, um, now I'm getting, uh, con um, oh, it was uh, Lance DeHaven Smith that found that one of the most pervasive crimes was assassination, murder. <laughs> People are getting, they literally are getting away with murder. 
Vietnam War, the USS Liberty, Iraq War, by the way, <laughs> under Mearsheimer, interestingly, finds that a strategic lie, the Bush administration uh, committed a series of strategic lies, not selfish lies. We know those were selfish lies. Thank you for making it bigger. I can see a little bit better now. Um, geoengineering, uh, ethnic global warming, that's the movement. 911 is a truth movement. And now we've got a new movement, SARS, coronavirus 2, and COVID-19. And there will be more. And then if you look at, if you look at the people who are known, these various truth movements, Julian Assange, Bill Benny, Michael Stuman, Jeffrey Sterling, Sabelle Edmonds, Dave McMichael, Karen Kwiatkowski, John Kiriakou. These are people that I would love to be my senator. I would love to have them as my president. I would love to have them as vice president. I would love to have them on the Supreme Court. I would love, these are people who have earned their stripes. We know that they, that their values are in sync with ours. They've been tested and they remain true to their own values and they remain true to ours. Next slide, please. So I need to explain just a minute about this complexity leadership of Mary Yule Bean. So basically what happens in complexity leadership or complex leadership, it all takes place within what's called a complex adaptive system. And you can see from the graphic here, you've got a puzzle and you need to put the pieces together. You gotta solve this puzzle. We gotta get to climate change truth. We gotta get to 911 truth. We gotta find out who killed JFK, who killed MFK, who killed RFK. We gotta find out those assassinations that took place in the 60s. We need to know who did it, who authorized it, and they need to be brought to justice. Well, now there's a, the complex adaptive system has some characteristics. Those characteristics is that you, you can't just do things the old fashioned way. You got to figure out a new way to do things. You have to, find a new way to think. You got to think outside of the box. You're trying to solve this problem. So now we've identified who the culprits are. We've identified um, what they did. We've identified that these things that they did are crimes. And yet now we got to figure out how we can bring them to justice and how we can transform the United States? How can we make the United States a better place to live, a better global partner, a better friend to the world? How can we make the United States governance system actually reflect our values? That's what we're trying to figure out here. And these truth movements demonstrate the ability to think outside of the box, to adapt to new situations, to learn. And at the same time, to produce outcomes. Now, I, it, it also must be said that this is not a, the complex adaptive system is not hierarchical in nature. And those of you in these various truth movements, you know, that there's no hierarchy. There's no, I did this and I did that and I'm going to do this and I got the answer because you're all trying to find the answer together. So the, the leadership structure is very flat and everyone 
has the opportunity to practice their skill at being a leader. Everyone becomes a leader in the complex adaptive system. Next slide, please. So you've learned the hard way. The members of the various truth movements know what's wrong. They've seen all the tricks of the enemy. You have seen your colleagues and your loved ones suicided or commit suicide. You know what it feels like to be infiltrated. You can smell the informant that is among you. And yet, despite having seen the worst that the other side has to offer to us, you still believe in the human spirit and in goodness and in kindness. And that's why I believe truth movements are complex adaptive systems that produce complexity leadership. Everyone that I have ever met in any of the truth movements is well suited for leadership to challenge, to face the 21st century challenges. Next slide, please. So now I know that um, I've spoken a lot to many different audiences about my idea of power cells. And that's where you get people from across the political spectrum and you come bring them together and they all sit down and you go through a series of, of um, sort of uh, behavioral science uh, gaming that uh, brings these disparate individuals and turns the group actually into a team, and then the team becomes that complex ad adaptive system that's solving the problems that confront all of the members in the team. Well, that's what the truth move, 911 truth, that's what you guys do. And with ethical governance as sort of like an overarching goal, Basically, what you have done, you have gone through the process of transforming yourselves because you were shocked to learn something happened. You were shocked at what you discovered and you stopped for a moment and said, oh, my goodness, it's called the disorienting dilemma. Oh, my goodness, my world has been rocked. And so then your behavior has changed. You become a part of the truth movement and that's what you live and breathe. And your goals and your values and your principles actually concretize be right before you and you understand why you were born and why you're living and what your mission in life is. Well, in my mind, um, what that is, is perfect training for the next step. And my idea is that you all are ready to go to the next step. Next slide, please. So as you identify the criminals and the crimes, I'd also like to ask you to think about what comes next. I think that's a role in the creation of what comes next after this current system dies from the weight of its own corruption and the exposure of that corruption by you, the truth activists. So, my plea is that you would think about strategies that we can employ to transform the U.S. people as you have transformed yourselves, transform the U.S. state by promoting 
truth movement veterans into state leadership positions. Now, I know we've had a few who have run for office, but now I think we need to get serious about supporting a slate or several slates, 50 slates for each state of truth movement activists who have the wherewithal to get in there and root out the corruption and bring the justice that the, I know the people of the United States are waiting for. Next slide. If you want to know more about Mearsheimer, Peter Dale Scott, Lance DeHaven Smith, or Mary U. Bean, I have included some reference links that are just videos, so it's real easy. I have all of their books, but um, you just look at those videos and you can find out more about these wonderful scholars. Next slide. Oh, that is the that's the last slide because I did another one that just says thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Cynthia is taking us, or she's expanding us, uh, saying that uh, truth activists should uh, do more now and get more involved in leadership in the state. Uh, very well said. And uh, I think you cause us, a lot of us to think about uh, that which, which you talked about. So thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you very much.